All right, we're just uh, waiting on the word that we are live and good. Okay. You're live. You're live. You're good. Hi, everyone. My name is McCallie Givens, and I am the Visitor Service and Collections Associate here at the Old Baldy Foundation. Um, thanks for joining us today on Facebook Live as we commemorate the 302nd anniversary of Steve Bonnet's execution in Charleston, South Carolina. I am here today with our um, Education and Collections Coordinator, Travis Gilbert, um, and he has spent the last few months really reading and researching uh, Steve Bonnet and all things Pirates in the Carolinas. Um, we're going to spend a little bit of time today uh, talking with Travis. Um, he's going to give us a little bit more information and his reflection on everything that he has read. Um, and the real question today is, how does the world remember the gentleman pirate um, on the day of his execution? Yeah, I think I've read so many things about pirates. I'm turning into a pirate. This yes. hair just keeps getting longer and longer. <laughs> when we started doing all these virtual videos, um, what, several Oh my goodness, almost a year ago yeah. now. Yeah, yeah, at least 10 months. Yeah. My hair was so short. We were preparing videos yeah. earlier and the hair was like a bowl cut yeah. at that point. <laughs> yeah, and now it's <laughs> almost to your shoulders. Yeah, <laughs> now I'm turning into a pirate. Uh, but yeah, thanks, McCallie. Um, it's, uh, it's been quite a journey. I don't think really many folks in the history of our foundation had explored fact versus fiction about pirates uh, before this endeavor. And it really started sometime around July, we decided that we were going to explore the year 1718 for the third annual Candlelight mm -hmm. uh, Historic Happy Hour, which is our holiday program, always a few days after Christmas. Uh, we had in years past explored the Civil War and then the Federalist period with Benjamin Smith. Yeah. So we thought this year we'd turn the dial back even further to 1718. And we wanted to make sure that we, we got it right, uh, that we were really not perpetuating some of the myths uh, or some of the misconceptions about pirates. So we went down this rabbit hole <laughs> and McCallie has delivered pounds and pounds of books, right? Uh, yes. Not exaggerating. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and we have arrived here just, uh, you know, two weeks or so before the big day where we get to play dress up yeah. and reenact mm -hmm. what 1718 must have been like for uh, Carolinians here in the Cape Fear. Um, just a few weeks after Steve Bonnet was executed uh, on this date in 1718. Yeah. So first give us a little bit of context about Bonnet and execution on December 10th, 1718. Yeah, so uh, if you recall, and we've done several videos together, kind of real-time tracking uh, the trials of Steve Bonnet uh, and his crew, and its connection to the Lower Cape Fear is the fact that they were captured here on September 26, 1718, in the mouth of the Cape Fear River, somewhere between Baldhead Island and Southport, in the mouth of the river there, uh, somewhere where we cross on the ferry to get yeah. to Baldhead Island, although we are not sure specifically where at this point. Uh, there was a uh, six, almost six hour battle out there between Steve Bonnet and pirate hunters that were under the command of Colonel William Rett. Uh, they were from Charlestown, South Carolina, sent here by uh, South Carolina's proprietary governor, Robert Johnson. And at the conclusion of that battle, Steve Bonnet and much of his crew were captured by Colonel Rhett and taken back down to Charlestown for trial. Now, as we've discussed in the videos, it's not just one big trial. I think we really learned that through yeah. our research and from other historians. Yeah. Uh, it was a, a series of trials uh, that centered around two prizes, uh, two sloops that Steed Bonnet had captured before he entered the mouth of the Cape Fear River and then brought with him. And of course, those prizes, the Fortune and the Francis, uh, were recovered by Colonel William Rhett after he successfully defeated Steve Bonnet in that battle in the Cape Fear River. So the fact that they had stolen those two prizes 
and imprison the captains and much of the crew of both those prizes, those were the charges that were represented. So not only are there multiple trials, there are multiple charges, really yeah. kind of four major- Yeah, four major ones. Right, yeah. right, for each of these pirates. Yeah. It's, it's for capturing each of the crews and then capturing each of the prizes. Well, during the trials, uh, Steve Bonnet and several counterparts, they actually escape custody yep. down in Charlestown. And I think yep. your character in the historic happy hour is really yep. going to discuss uh, some of that. Yep. Uh, how Steve Bonnet escapes custody from downtown Charlestown and finds himself in Sullivan's Island. And Colonel Rhett is going to go back out and battle Steve Bonnet once again, this time on Sullivan's Island. Some of his counterparts are going to be killed, but Steve Bonnet is going to surrender to Colonel Rhett once again and be brought back down to trial in Charlestown. And he is going to be found guilty uh, and ordered executed yeah. by Judge Nicholas Trott. And I love this quote uh, in the execution. Uh, it says, after a long-winded speech. <laughs> Very long-winded. Spirit um, <laughs> definitely brings the Bible into it, referencing the Bible. Just I mean, a few times, right? Just a few times. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he says that, that you said Steve Bonnet shall go from hence to the place from whence you came, and from thence to a place of execution, where you shall be hanged by the neck till you are dead. And the God of infinite mercy be merciful to your soul. So on this date, uh, according to, um, you know, there's a difference between the Julian and the, and the Gregorian calendar. The Gregorian calendar uh, is not adopted by the British colonies in Britain until 1752. But for all intents and purposes, on this date, on December the 10th, 1718, uh, Steve Bonnet is executed as Judge Trott ordered in White Point. Uh, and we're not quite sure uh, where he's buried as we're going to discuss. Yeah, so where is White Point today? And how is this execution site commemorated? Yeah, so uh, White Point today is actually a garden, or it's, it's a public park in modern day downtown Charleston, South Carolina. So um, you kind of, uh, first of all, know that Charlestown and Charles Tun are the same city. So they changed their name. I actually don't know off the top of my head when Charlestown becomes Charles Tun. Yeah. But um, it, uh, the city has gone through immense amounts of change, specifically the infilling of areas that were formerly marsh or tidal creeks that were filled in with debris or rubble so you could build later homes on top. So what we see is Charleston, South Carolina today uh, looked very, very different when Steve Bonnet was hanged in 1718. Part of that is this peninsula, the very, very tip of the peninsula where the Ashley and Cooper rivers meet. There used to be what they called White Point. And it was an area that was above water during low tide and had I have heard accounts that there was midden, which is uh, shell deposits of shellfish, oyster okay. shells yeah. that were eaten by indigenous peoples to the South Carolina or the, the, that river, uh, or the, excuse me, that locale. And they would discard the shells and the shells would accumulate. And of course, ice, oyster shells, once they bleach in the sun, they turn white. Yeah. So this pile of midden oyster shells well, at, again, at low tide, it would stick up out of the water, but that at high tide, it would go underwater, kind of like frying pan shoals off of Bald Head Island today. Well, through that infill I discussed, Charleston looking much different today, they, in the antebellum period, these Charlestonians, they infilled it uh, to a point where now it's all dry land all the time by building what we call the battery today. Uh, it's a, you know, famous area of Charleston, and they built a park. And that park, or offshore of that park in the river, is where this execution occurred. And I'm going to um, share our screen and show you uh, how it is commemorated today.
All right. Uh, so that's the park you see, and you see uh, the river or the Har Charleston Harbor uh, in the view shed out there off that, it looks like a Columbiad. So there's lots of monuments and various pieces of artillery in White Point Gardens today. But right before World War II, uh, the uh, Historical Commission in Charleston commemorated the spot by building that monument. And it's a very, very simple monument. And it reads, near this spot in the autumn of 1718, Steve Bonnet, notorious gentleman pirate, and 29 of his men captured by Colonel William Rhett met their just desserts after a trial and charge famous in American history by Chief Justice Nicholas Trott. Later, 19 of Richard Worley's crew captured by Governor Robert Johnson were also found guilty and hanged. All were buried off White Point Gardens in the marsh beyond the low water mark. Uh, well, you know, McCallie, I gotta be honest, it's next to impossible to bury somebody in a tidal marsh. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, I don't know how you would dig um, in a tidal marsh. Um, it's my experience here at Ballhead yeah. that, it work. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's you know, the marsh is gonna out. fall <laughs> back in or it's gonna fill up with water. And even if somehow miraculously you were able to um, dig a shallow grave, well, the tide going back and forth, it's going to uncover the bodies within a short time. Yeah. What I also wonder is, there's a long tradition in the British Empire at this time to um, keep the bodies of executed pirates on display near a harbor or the entrance of a harbor or a river to warn other mariners of the fate of pirates. It's kind of like a, you know, a positive reinforcement or whatnot, you know, don't turn to piracy, don't go a pirating yeah. because you're gonna be hanged mm -hmm. and then your body's gonna rot and be fodder for the birds and whatnot yeah. at the entrance of some harbor in the British Empire. So, Perhaps uh, Steve Bonnet, I think it's, it's likely that perhaps his body was displayed at the entrance of Charleston Harbor for days, weeks, months, years yeah. perhaps uh, to warn other mariners of their fate if they went a pirating like Captain Kidd or others, Boston has a tradition of this. I think that's more likely than somehow miraculously they, uh, the Charlestonians in 1718 being able to bury uh, the bodies in this tidal area. Uh, and one last point I want to bring out, McCallie, is I had this question when I was learning about the execution, why they would um, pick a tidal area. See, yeah. like all these pirates that I had been reading about and so many different accounts, uh, the pirates were hanged, executed, and buried or displayed in these areas where at like White Point were above water at high or low tide and below water during high tide. And it had to do with jurisdiction. So we learned that Judge Nicholas Trott in the trials of Steed Bonnet and these pirates, uh, it was in a vice admiralty court. And the vice admiralty court's jurisdiction is in maritime affairs. Yes. Uh, so they try crimes that are committed on the high seas, whereas you know, other courts have jurisdiction on crimes that, are or that occur on dry land. Well, since the crimes of Steve Bonnet occurred on the high seas, but he was tried on dry land, yeah. the vice admiralty court for Steve Bonnet and many other pirates needed to execute a pirate in this kind of gray area, yeah. if you will that in some portions of the day are on the high seas, quote unquote, and in other times during the day are on dry land. Uh, it's that blurring of the lines between course jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. And that is why Steve Bonnet was executed 
in this tidal area and what is today uh, White Point Gardens in downtown Charleston. Yeah. So before we talk about how Steve Bonnet was commemorated in the Lower Cape Fear area, why don't you talk a little about um, who kind of owned area around White Point that would be um, known to us here? I, well, well, let me, uh, okay. actually you read it because um, you taught me this. Okay. It's an it's, interesting connection. Um, so Thomas Landgrave Smith, who acquired Baldhead Island and Smith Island Complex is known for actually owned land around White Point. So it's a really cool little connection to Baldhead Island that he owned property around here. And Colonel Rhett is actually the ancestor of Benjamin Smith, who is Thomas Landgrave Smith's um, grandson. Some kind yep, of grandson. grandson Some grandson. great grandsons. <laughs> and, yeah, and Sarah Dry um, Smith, who was Benjamin Smith's wife. So it's this weird kind of connection to this pirate team and Baldhead Island more than just Steve Bonnet getting caught here yeah and captured so it's all in the family yeah all in the family it's really um uh, yeah all in the family like you said um and Frank Newton um said hi and he hopes to get out here um in the springtime fingers crossed and meet us all so just Frank (laughs) um tell me a little bit about how Steve Bonnet is commemorated here in Cape Fear area yeah so um we don't have a nice garden, <laughs> but we have a, do have a similar monument before I go back to um, seeing our uh, faces. I'll, I'll show you this other monument. So Steve Bonnet is commemorated here in the Lower Cape Fear with this monument located uh, just north of downtown Southport, uh, just north of the old Smithville Burying Grounds. Yeah. You actually have to pass this monument uh, in order to get from D Point Marina, where you get on the ferry to go to Baldhead, to get into downtown Southport. And I was uh, very curious about this monument because we had done a, a Facebook Live at this location back in September on the 302nd anniversary of, of the Battle of the Sandbars, or a battle in the Cape Fear River between Colonel Rhett and Steve Bonnet. And the monument says, Steve Bonnet, the gentleman pirate, used the mouth of this creek as a hideout for his vessel, uh, this vessel, uh, the Royal James, formerly called Revenge. Here on September 26, 1718, the great battle of the sandbars was fought between the pirates and the men sent to capture them under the command of Colonel William Rhett aboard the Henry and the Seaman. After a 24-hour battle, there were 19 men killed, 23 wounded, and Bonnet, with the remains of his pirate crew, surrendered. On November 8, 1718, 29 of the pirates were hanged in Charleston, South Carolina, and a few weeks later, uh, holding a cluster of flowers in his manacled hands, gentleman Steed Bonnet met the same fate on the gallows. This part of the Cape Fear was a favorite meeting place for pirates, including the notorious Blackbeard and Mary Ann Blythe, the woman buccaneer. Well, I was uh, wondering, I've got a little fixation, a little bit of soapbox on monuments, <laughs> as McCallie knows. Yeah. So I went, to, uh, I went a pirating or a digging <laughs> to figure out when this was placed and why. Uh, unfortunately, to this very moment, I couldn't pinpoint a specific date, but I am very convinced that it was erected in the 1960s. And I base that uh, very educated guess on two facts. Uh, first of all, a city manager, uh, uh, the last name Pickerel, uh, Charles Dickey Pickerel was a city manager uh, for Southport. He was the brainchild of creating this monument. So I looked at when he was the city manager And then I found a newspaper article from the Wilmington Star News. And I was able to find uh, the journalist that wrote that article and figure out the, he only was an author or a journalist at the Star News for 10 years. So the only time that Mr. Pickerall and this journalist were in both of their vocations at the same time was in the 1960s. So some point in the 1960s, they erected this monument. Uh, So again, it was the brainchild of bureaucrats that worked for the city of Southport. Uh, The research uh, was completed by several staff members 
at the uh, Harper Library, today the Harper Library. Actually, Margaret Harper uh, contributed to creating the text for that uh, monument. And the monies was raised by several garden clubs okay. in the city of Southport. Uh, so I find it curious as with other monuments in the Lower Cape Fear, uh, this was the work of women yep. and women's organizations. Yep. Uh, and I think there's, there's more to be said about yep. women and Steve Bonnet, uh, perhaps at the happy hour, perhaps yep. later on in the interview. Uh, but again, the brainchild of women. Now, where is the situation? Why, why is it called this creek? And I encourage you to go back to that video on Facebook Live. The creek that this is situated along is known as Bonnet's Creek. And it's a tidal but largely freshwater creek that empties into the Cape Fear River just north of downtown Southport. There's actually a housing development uh, located just north of Southport with the name Bonnet's Creek as well. Well, this monument says that it's a hideout for this vessel. Well, McCallie and I have explored that creek. Yeah. There's no way you're gonna fit even a small <laughs> sloop in this creek. No. There's absolutely no way. It just, it, I, it just would not work. So the creek is certainly not a hideout. Now, as we'll discuss a little bit later on in the interview, um, there certainly was a reason that Steve Bono would be attracted to that creek, and that is to collect fresh water yep. or to careen his vessel, uh, to turn the vessel over and perform maintenance on the hull of the ship. And recall, not only does he have his pirate ship, the Royal James or the Revenge, whichever you want to call it, but these two prizes as well, yep. Fortune and the Francis, were hanging out here. Um, the other kind of problem I have with this monument is the fact that it says that the Cape Fear was a favorite meeting place for pirates with like Blackbeard and Marianne Blythe. Um, we don't have any evidence, any historical evidence to suggest any other pirates other than Steve Bonnet and his crew yeah. ever made it to the Cape Fear. Yeah. And not only that, we don't even have any evidence to suggest that even Steve Bonnet stepped foot onto Bald Head Island. Yeah. He certainly was in the waterways around Bald Head Island, but we have no idea if he stepped foot on the island proper. So I think that this is a little bit of a legend uh, or, or mythology uh, that uh, is seeping into a public monument very similar to the mythology or legend that is seeping into the monument at White Point Gardens about the pirates being buried uh, offshore in this tidal marsh, which would have been nearly as impossible as fitting a pirate ship in Bonnet's Creek. Yeah, so why do you think some of this, where do you think some of this mythology originated from? Yeah, well, it's a great question, McCallie, and it really originates with the first book or, or publication of sorts ever written about pirates. And it was written less than 10 years after Steve Bonnet was executed on this date in 1718. And I think our, our next slide here, we have, uh, yeah, here we go. We have a, a picture of one of the editions, uh, the front page of one of the editions, and it's called A General History of Pirates. And we've discussed this book in depth on some of our other videos throughout the autumn here of diving into the history of pirating in the Carolinas. Now, the author you see there by Captain Charles Johnson, that's a pseudonym, and there are a, a bunch of educated guesses on who Charles Johnson might be in real life. Um, we're very much partial uh, to several historians here. I mean, you know, we always have a favorite yeah. or two. Yeah. Uh, and some of my favorite historians that I've gotten to know and read their works over the past few months suggest that it's Nathaniel Mist. He was a newspaper publisher in London uh, at this time. And uh, he is publishing works that are salacious, 
uh, one might call them like a tabloid today. Yeah. So when you dive into the text of a general history of pirates, regardless of whether it was written by this tabloid editor Nathaniel Mist or not, yeah. you can read between the lines and very quickly ascertain that this book was written not to educate, but to entertain. Uh, it is very um, sexist at this point. Uh, it's very racist at some point uh, when you apply your 21st century standards upon the text. Um, it's made to, you know, have a gut laugh. I've yeah. laughed at several <laughs> times. And much of this mythology about Steve Bonnet originates with this general history of pirates. It's from this text that we learned that Steve Bonnet uh, was a, a gentleman with a liberal education from the Caribbean island of Barbados, that he goes a pirating to escape uh, a wife or a marital state that he yeah. wasn't so happy in. Uh, it's from this text that it's suggested that he uh, not only paid for the sloop, uh, the revenge, or later the Royal James to be constructed, but rather than finding a crew of pirates that just wanted to be rich, he, he actually paid the pirates to crew this yeah. vessel that he constructed. Um, I mean, come on, think. You imagine, how would you hide the true motives of building a ship in yeah. like Carlisle Bay and Barbados and Bridgetown. You can. Yeah, right. It's, that would be pretty impossible. It'd be a lot of um, mischievous um, fibbing going on yeah. on Steve Bonnet's behalf. Um, and it's also from this text that we get this idea that Steve Bonnet's kind of like a, like a bumbling fool, that yeah. he's in way over his head. Incompetent. Incompetent. Yeah. Uh, it's from this text in a later edition. There's several editions of this published, the first being in 1724 and then 1726, and then it goes on and on and on through several uh, uh, editions. But this uh, image there to the left, this appears in one of those editions. And, and folks, we don't have obviously a photograph. We don't even have a painting, a portrait of what Steve Bonnet looked like. Yeah. So from this salacious tabloid entertainment publication, we form this idea that Steve Bonnet was uh, wearing a, you know, formal attire with a wig. Um, this is just based on speculation to entertain. This is not based on fact. Yeah. And what has come to our, um, we become aware. Yeah that unfortunately pieces of scholarship from 1724 on rely heavily upon a general history of pirates by Charles Johnson. They constantly are using this publication as a wealth of, or a well, a font of information about Steve Bonnet. And the problem is this publication written for entertainment purposes, not for accuracy or for scholarship, it has swallowed the historiography of Steve Bonnet to this very day. Yeah. Yeah, so historiography is a word that some of us, our viewers might not be familiar with. Uh, so really in the broadest sense, Historiography, historiography is the study of history of history. Um, so it's taking a look at what all these other historians have written and studied on the topic and put it together. You know, um, for example, in graduate school, I did a historiography of the social history of the Vietnam conflict. Um, conflict. So I looked at the Vietnam War and like the social history and looked at what other historians had said about that. So you are going to talk to us a little bit about what you have learned about the historiography of Steve Bonnet. Yeah, um, they've taken the bumbling fool <laughs> and run with it. Yeah. Um, if you're going to study what has been written about Steve Bonnet, it's verbatim what is written here yeah. in the general history of pirates, unfortunately. 
Uh, and just a, a few examples from, and folks, we've spent months reading so many different things about pirates. Yeah. So, um, and that's a point that should be made. Um, unfortunately, the resources here at the Old Baldy Foundation and with COVID, I mean, we can't hop on a plane and go to an archives and yeah in Barbados or <laughs> in London. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so much of what we've been doing the past few months is a historiography yeah. of, of Steve Bonnet, of, of studying and writing about what other historians have written about with Steve Bonnet. And the first that really calls to mind, and I, I gotta admit, it's one of my favorites, just because it isn't um, the most accurate doesn't mean yeah. it isn't a favorite and it's or not just because his name is Robert E. Lee <laughs> um, but this uh, he was a, um, a law professor and wrote one of the first books in the 1970s about uh, Blackbeard yeah. so it's a book so much of what we had to do is read about Blackbeard because Steve Bonnet is a partner of Blackbeard's for a significant amount of time during Steve Bonnet's the acts of piracies, which only last you know, two years yeah. or so, uh, a little more. So again, it was written by Robert E. Lee in the 1970s, and he was the Dean Professor uh, uh, of the Law School at Wake Forest. And it's called Blackbeard the Pirate, a reappraisal of his life and times. And uh, I just want to read a little passage about uh, Steed Bonnet. Um, he says that Steve Bonnet was a retired army officer in the King's Guards who owned a large sugar plantation near Bridgetown on the island of Barbados, sometimes referred to as the Gentleman Pirate. He was a military officer from a good family, educated and cultured, and he owned a substantial amount of land on the island where he had settled. He was highly respected by his neighbors, and they were greatly surprised when in 1717 he suddenly decided to become a pirate. There were even those who said he had gone so far as to get away from a nagging wife, purchasing with his own funds a sloop, naming it the Revenge, a favorite name for ships among pirates. He equipped it with 10 guns. It was customary to steal the vessel in which one intended to operate as a pirate. Major Bonnet recruited a crew of 70 men, some of which were experienced pirates, and departed one night without saying goodbye to Mrs. Bonnet. And thus is born the nagging wife theory. Yeah. So when we get folks that come for a tour to Bald Head Island, they all know about the nagging wife theory. Yes. And in fact, they call it the nagging wife theory. I've picked up on calling it the nagging wife theory. I have too. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is a perfect example of historiography. It's this idea that, okay, it originates with the general history of pirates. Captain Charles Johnson says, not nagging wife. He says that he's trying to escape a, a sad state of marital affairs, basically. Robert E. Lee in the 1970s takes that and applies and invents this term nagging wife. Now what? We weren't even born in the 1970s. In 2020, now it's called the nagging wife theory. Yeah. And it originates in 1724, but coined in the 1970s. He needed to add his own spin on it so he could be in the history books later on. Exactly. That's what happens. Exactly. <laughs> and let me take another example, just one more little quote. Uh, this is Lily Butler. Uh, he wrote this really great book called Pri uh, Pirates. And I'm actually going to stop sharing the screen here. He wrote this lovely book called Pirates and Privateers and Rebel Raiders on the Carolina Coast. And he tracks um, various characters uh, in maritime history of the Carolinas, uh, not all pirates. Like, mm -hmm. for example, the pirates are Blackbeard and Steve Bonnet. But he goes up and through the Civil War uh, with folks that are on ironclads. Uh, so not your traditional pirates in a sense. Well, in uh, talking about uh, Steve Bonnet on the execution, he says, and just to read a passage, 
On the 10th of December, the citizens of Charleston gathered for the spectacle of Major Steve Bonnet's final passage to White Point Gallows that had claimed the lives of most of his men. Accompanied by a militia escort, the drumbeat sounding his death knell, the cart bore the stooped bonnet, who had held a wilted bouquet in his manacled hands. To witness the once proud gentleman reduced to such a low state evoked conflicting emotions in the crowd. Those who saw him as a monster jeered, some sensed the tragedy and wept, still others felt the degradation of the moment and stood silent. The pirate chieftain lost his last shred of dignity, nearly fainting as he approached the scaffold. In a stupor, he was held upright by the marshal's deputies as the noose was tightened around his neck. With the crack of a whip, the cart jolted away, leaving his body swaying in the cold wind. It's very poetic. It's very, very poetic. poetic. Yeah. yeah um, I mean, no offense to Lindley Butler, but I'm not quite sure some of these details, <laughs> uh, he quite knows, yeah. right? He's setting a scene without, I have found any primary resources to back up those claims for setting a scene. And he doesn't cite them either. So it's like, you don't really know where he got it so we could go look ourselves. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I have been trying to find the manacled hands. I, I sure he was manacled. Yeah. I've been trying to find um, the flowers where yeah. where we get this idea that there were flowers in his manacled hands, because the monument. When I was reading the notes for the monument in Southport, uh, it talks about the manacled hands and mm -hmm. the flowers, and it suggests in the notes some of which made it onto the engraving on the plaque some of which did not. Steve Bonnet becomes almost like effeminate at the yeah. end. When faced with death, he goes from this honorable gentleman that everyone waxes poetic about, he's called the gentleman pirate, and he turns more and more effeminate yeah. by the time that he's executed on this date in 1718. And we can trace that historiography again from 1724, General History of Pirates, through a modern historian like Lindley Butler uh, into what we know today. We get oftentimes folks on the tour um, suggest that when Steve Bonnet escaped custody before his execution in Charleston, he was disguised as a woman. Yep. And that's how he escaped over to Sullivan's Island. It's nowhere in the primary resources. Yes. And I'm convinced that it was because these historians and this historiography is effeminating him. That's yeah. how you would describe it towards the end. And uh, what a better way than to let's have him dress up as a woman, dress yeah. and drag. Yeah. Uh, for the end, he was that worried uh, when faced with that. Yeah. So you've talked a little bit about your tours and visitors coming, and they ha sometimes have certain expectations about pirates or believe in the mythology. How do you um, kind of correct that or educate them uh, without making it boring almost or having the guests kind of tune out? Yeah, well, it's, um, it's a great question. Um, I mean, we hear it all the time, yeah. uh, you know, folks, I think a, a favorite thing for families to do on Bald Head Island is to create a treasure hunt. Yeah, well, <laughs> you know, it's uh, um, at first, I think that the first obligation that we have here at the Old Baldy Foundation is to obviously tell the facts. Yes. We don't want to perpetuate this mythology. Uh, and and sometimes we have. Sometimes I've gotten things wrong, and incidentally, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's hard when you know you're just getting started and you're young, and this is somewhat uh, you know it, at first it's at some point it has to be new material. Yes, <laughs> you know at some point or another it's going to be new for anybody. Um, so the first obligation in in sticking to the facts is to tell the factual story in such an entertaining way folks forget about their preconceived notions and they learn that the truth is just as entertaining yeah. as the mythology or the preconceived notions that they arrived on the ferry with. So 
if they're looking for Blackbeard's treasure, I mean, the lighthouse keeper Charles Norton Slon was yeah. looking for Cavender yeah. or, or for uh, Blackbeard's treasure when he was out here. Yeah. So if they arrive on the ferry looking for Blackbeard's treasure, rather than killing their momentum, destroying their <laughs> sense of adventure yeah. and excitement for being on this wonderful magical place that they've heard pirates used to hang out on, uh, rather than saying no, rather than that being the first thing out of my mouth saying, well, you know, Blackbeard was never here, entertain them with this factual story about Steve Bonnet. And once they've heard this wild story of this man who we can't figure out why escaped from Barbados, yeah. don't say he was escaping a nagging wife, leave it to their own imagination. What would make this man leave? Yeah. And this wild tale of how he was partners with Blackbeard and eventually found the Cape Fear River. And oh my goodness, the pirate battle occurs when they're all trapped on the sandbar and they're duking it out with small arms fire. And then he's brought back down to Charlestown. And then he escapes again and, and entertain them with this wild factual story. And then once they've gained an appreciation for what we know or have a very educated guess is the truth. Then burst the bubble and have been entertained <laughs> and do it in a light way and say, well, the historical evidence, the historic evidence suggests that Blackbeard never visited Bald Head Island, never entered the Cape Fear River. And remind them as historians, we are looking for evidence in the written word or material evidence as well. We work with archeological yeah. remains often. More McCallie than me. <laughs> um, we're dealing with the written word. So if nobody wrote down that Blackbeard was here or that Steve Bonnet set foot on Baldhead Island, I can't ethically tell you that they did, but I also can't tell you that they did. Yeah. Because how often have historical events occurred and nobody wrote it down or they did write it down and we just haven't laid eyes on it yet yeah or some historian well above our pay grade <laughs> hasn't written it down or discovered it yet and left that written word to us so we can regurgitate or reflect mm -hmm. upon and expound on our public programming so there's a polite and kind way of doing it without killing the spirit and the excitement that brought that guest to us in the first place. Mm -hmm. So you say on your tour that Steve Bonnet's execution marked the beginning of the end of the golden age of piracy. It's a really big statement. But before we dive into that big picture, let me ask you, what were some of the immediate consequences of Steve Bonnet's execution? Yeah, well, um, you know, first let's let's take it back. I think that rather than there being these immediate consequences of his execution, um, there were more significant and immediate consequences stemming from Steve Bonnet's capture yeah. in late September here in the Cape Fear River in 1718. And the immediate effect was we cannot forget that. South Carolinians entered the waters of another proprietary colony of North Carolina. They did so without permission from North Carolina's proprietary governor. They did so without any North Carolinians knowing yeah. that we're aware of that they were on their way. They invaded a sister colony and captured somebody within a colony who they did not have jurisdiction over. And then not only did they evade and capture, wage war on a sister colony's shores, they didn't even try and execute that individual or those individuals for their crimes in the jurisdiction where the crimes occurred. Yeah. They took them and left this colony and went back to their own home colony of South Carolina and tried and executed Steve Bonnet and his crew there. And that set a precedent for Virginians 
under the leadership of Lieutenant Governor Alexander Spotswood to do the same with Blackbeard, to invade a sister colony in North Carolina. Uh, Ellis Brand led a contingent by foot, invaded and arrived in Bath, North Carolina by land. And then uh, a Lieutenant Maynard, he invaded by sea, yeah. uh, entering, as we learned from Kevin Duffus to Roanoke Inlet and through the, you know, the Croatan and uh, Pamlico Sound uh, to wage war with Blackbeard uh, at Ocracoke. So I would like to believe from various historians and reading uh, their accounts that perhaps Virginia would not have had the audacity to invade North Carolina and kill Blackbeard on our waters if it had not been for the precedent of South Carolina invading North Carolina several weeks earlier to capture Steve Bonnet offshore of Bald Head Island. And, and one last point, McCallie, I think about that is this sense that it was more, in my opinion, it was more severe for Virginia to invade North Carolina than South Carolina to invade North Carolina because there was a precedent established during the Tuscarora Wars, which is a war that occurred between the indigenous peoples in North Carolina, the Tuscarora natives, and the, the white settlers in the years just before these pirating yes. adventures, uh, 1715, 1716, just preceding the Battle of the Sandbars. Well, North Carolina, North Carolina did not have the funds, the resources, the men, uh, or the leadership to successfully wage war against these indigenous peoples. So they asked their brethren Carolinians to the South. They asked South Carolina to send militia up here to North Carolina yeah. to quell the unrest with the natives. And it was two militias, uh, one and then another. They did that because both North Carolina and South Carolina were proprietary colonies, meaning that they were business ventured ventures owned by these lords proprietors. And that goes back to Charles II. He's given eight lords proprietors this land between Virginia and Spanish Florida and says, this is yours. Make some money off of it. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's, it's a present for you remaining loyal to me during the wrapping up of the English Civil Wars. So there is a bond, there's a connection. Even though there's a difference between North Carolina and South Carolina at this time, they were at once the same colony and they still were under the ownership. They still had the same owners or bosses back in England. Yes. Whereas Virginia was a royal colony. Yes. Virginia had a royal governor and it was, I mean, they were all under the jurisdiction of the monarch, but it was a different system. So I would like to think that a rural colony invading essentially the kind of like the private property of the Lord's proprietors and then the private property of whoever bought the land from the Lord's proprietors and paying quit rents off of it, like a lease, um, was a little harsher of a precedent, a little more of a, took a little more audacity to do that. And I think that's the immediate consequence of Steve Bonnet's capture and then later execution. Because not only did they capture it, they got away with it because yeah. they ended up executing him. Yeah. So how about the far-reaching consequences? Yeah, I think it stems back to that idea of the proprietary colony. So um, there is a significant amount of unrest that is occurring in both North Carolina and South Carolina while Blackbeard and Steve Bonnet are plying these waters. And that unrest had nothing to do with pirates. I'm beginning to think that the pirating was a um, consequence or a symptom of these other questions or these bigger um, problems, these bigger spheres of unrest. And it was between a faction of North and South Carolinians that wanted to become a royal colony yeah. and these North and South Carolinians that wanted to remain a proprietary colony under the rule of these Lords proprietors back in England. 
they had watched Virginia successfully use the crown's resources to quell unrest with the natives and have better infrastructure and whatnot. And the Lord's proprietors that own North and South Carolina, uh, they were not very involved. Just during the Tuscarora Wars in North Carolina, the Lord's proprietors, they don't send help. They can't get the Royal Navy or the army to show up to help. The white settlers are being slaughtered and the Lord's proprietors aren't doing anything about it. Yeah. And in South Carolina, they have a, a different kind of native war that stirs up some of that unrest. So specifically here in North Carolina, when Steve Bonnet and Blackbeard are um, killed or captured, the anti-proprietary faction are led by a gentleman named Edward Mosley and Colonel Maurice Moore. Colonel Maurice Moore was one of those South Carolinians that kind of came up here to help defeat the natives and then stuck around. He liked what he saw. (laughs) And uh, let me just share my screen again and uh, show you all. Uh oh, it's not moving now. Yeah, there we go. Uh, I think Edward Mosley is most famously known for creating the 1733 map. And when we were digitizing our um, life saving service. Uh, reports at the Joiner Library, the Special Collections Library up at East Carolina University. I had the ultimate nerd moment of 2019 (laughs) and got to see this map and get really, really close to it. And I just died of excitement. Um, He's most famous for creating this map in 1733. But before he did that, Colonel Maurice Moore and Edward Mosley used Blackbeard being in North Carolina to invade the office of Secretary John Lovick or Lovick. He was basically the proprietary um, North Carolina secretary. And Mr. Moore and Mr. Um, Mosley kick him out of his office, lock the door behind them, and search through all these official papers of the colony in North Carolina, looking for evidence that would prove that our proprietary governor, Charles Eden, and his, uh, this other official, Tobias Knight, colluded with Blackbeard, offered him safe harbor here in North Carolina. And if they found the evidence that suggested that these rural, or these, excuse me, these proprietary officials were colluding with a pirate like Blackbeard, that would be enough evidence to create a revolution against Governor Eden, against Thomas Pollock, against Tobias Knipe, and once and for all, throw off the yoke of proprietary rule here in North Carolina and instill North Carolina as a world colony. Now they never found the evidence they were looking for, (laughs) unfortunately for them. And they were, there was eventually some litigation that occurred uh, because of that crime of of locking John Lovick uh, out of his office. Now in South Carolina, there was, um, there was a successful revolution. So the same kind of political factions are occurring in South Carolina. This anti-proprietary faction that wants to be its own rural rural colony, and this pro-proprietary faction that wants to remain under the ownership of the Lord's proprietors. And the pro-proprietary leaders are the very leaders that are leading the capture and trial of Steve Bonnet. Yes. It's Nicholas Trott the justice of the vice admiralty court that tries Steve Bonnet. It's Colonel William Rett, the commander that leads the expedition into the Cape Fear River and eventually uh, captures Steve Bonnet and then has to recapture him again in the Battle of Sullivan's Island. 
these two, Nicholas Trot and Colonel William Rat, not only are they intermarried to one another, they're the yeah. same family, they are receiving so much patronage mm -hmm. from the Lord's proprietors. These lucrative yeah. government offices. Yeah. And they want the proprietors to continue to rule South Carolina because they are financially rewarded and they hold the power. They hold the keys to the government down in South Carolina. So all this unrest that occurs in Charleston, all these sympathies that we've been reading about within the populace, mm -hmm. sympathetic towards Steve Bonnet and these pirates, I'm beginning to think those were the individuals that wanted to have royal governance in South Carolina. They were looking for a way to throw off the rule of men like Nicholas Trott and Colonel William Rett and introduce rural governance in South Carolina. So to wrap it up, I think I'm beginning to learn, McCallie, that the pirates are just a small symptom, a scapegoat, yeah. if you will, for this larger picture of these two factions pro-proprietary rule and anti-proprietary rule that are existing both in South Carolina and in North Carolina when the pirates find these colonies and find what they think is safe harbor amongst these colonies. And maybe some of that safe harbor is because of the strife, the internal strife mm -hmm. uh, that is occurring between these two factions in the colonies. And I think we're gonna explore that theme in more detail in the historic happy hour coming up. Yeah. I Definitely think so. So let me conclude our conversation today by circling back to the original question. How does the world remember Steve Bonham? Uh, unfortunately, I think they remember him as the fool. Yeah. You know, um, I think that he is, if I were to sum it up, he's the comedic relief for Blackbeard's story. I think so too. And it, one thing I see merchandise wise, you don't see a lot of Steve Bonnet stuff or sell anywhere. You right. always see Blackbeards and a couple other pirates, but you're not going into a store like, I want Steve Bonnet's black. Dang. Right. You're not seeing that there. It's just a backup character. But he did play a lot of roles into ending piracy and getting caught and the changing in government. So, absolutely. Yeah, I think there's so much to uncover. He's like an onion. The more you peel back, once you get over the hurdle of being disappointed that he wasn't escaping a nagging <laughs> wife, once you get over the joke and the tomfoolery, yeah. there are some significant historical questions to be asked about Steve Bonnet. And the answers to those questions implicate these other social and political movements occurring at the precipice of proprietary rule in yeah. each of the Carolinas. And unfortunately, the world doesn't remember that. Yeah. The world doesn't ask those questions. Yeah. The monuments in White Point Garden and at Bonnets Creek and Southport don't ask the viewer to ponder or to reflect upon those questions and that social and political unrest in the Carolinas. They just are trying to entice you to get a giggle yeah. about this fool, this jester, yeah. this sidekick of Steve Bonnet. And I'll repeat it again. I think he is the comedic relief to the story of Blackbeard. And I hope that here at the Old Baldy Foundation, through this months of digging through the narrative about Steve Bonnet, we in the years forward can get more and more visitors to reflect upon those serious questions about Steve Bonnet and leave the mythology and the comedic relief at Deep Point Marina on the mainland. Yeah. Or at least don't bring it back to the mainland uh, yeah. once they spent time spend with it. us. Yeah. yeah. I think that's a great way to think about it. Um, and our sweet volunteer, Phil, um, said hello. Oh, hey, Phil. <laughs> um, 
So I want to end saying thank you to everybody for joining us today on the 302nd anniversary of Steve Bonnet's execution. Uh, we'll conclude our 2020 programming and explorations of Steve Bonnet with our third annual candlelight uh, historic happy hour on Saturday, December 27th at 5 p.m. This year, we are gonna dial back the clock to Christmas 1718, um, when the Carolinas felt the repercussions of Steve Bonnet and Blackbeard's death. I, I'm gonna be dressed up as somebody that was at the trials, um, a female at the trials sitting in. And I'm gonna be a one of Steve Bonnet's prisoners. Yeah. I think we decided I was yeah. gonna be on the fortune. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think we decided we were gonna be on the fortune. <laughs> so I'm gonna take care of the battle and you're the trial. I'm the trial. <laughs> so uh, we'll be dressed up in costume, uh, portraying um, historical figures um, on the lighthouse grounds and we will decorate the grounds with hundreds of luminaries. Uh, for more information and to register, head over to our website, oldbaldy.org. Uh, space is limited due to COVID restrictions, and if you can't make it in person, uh, the program will be live streamed here on our Facebook page. Um, and we hope uh, we hope you can join us for our final 2020 program. Um, thank you again for tuning in today. Yeah, thanks everybody, and uh, we hope to see you yeah. in person at the Candlelight Happy Hour or uh, virtually. Yeah. We'll we'll give you all a hello. Yeah.